Adam, thank you so much for joining the show and sharing um, your experiences with us. Let's start with Daffy, how you got to become the CEO of Daffy, what Daffy is, and what its uh, outlook for the future is. Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to talk about that. Um, you know, uh, I mean, the simple answer is Daffy. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Daffy. And so in some ways, I gave myself uh, the job, as it turns out. <laughs> but um, Daffy is a very simple thing. Daffy stands for the Donor Advised Fund for You. It, it, it's a very simple insight that there's about 60 million Americans, households, who, who give to charity every year. Um, but where is the kind of great application? Where is the great service that helps bring them together and makes it easier to be more generous more often? And so, you know, we've had all this fintech innovation in the last 10 to 15 years, all these great apps that help people, you know, save a little bit more, maybe spend a little bit smarter, invest better. Um, but Daffy was built around the idea of building an easy app that helps people give. And so it's a modern platform for charitable giving. Um, now, under the hood, it, it's built off a donor advised fund, which is, of course, a very popular product for the wealthy, um, a lot of tax advantages, et cetera, to putting money aside for charity. And we're hoping that we can open up those advantages to everyone who, who gives and supports organizations and causes. Um, in terms of the founding story, I mean, Alejandro, my co-founder, was one of my favorite engineers to work with uh, at LinkedIn. We had been kept in touch and talking about starting a company for years. And, you know, he got very excited about this idea. I was excited about this idea. And so we, we dove into it. Um, so those are the basics of the, of the Daffy story. I mean, we launched a couple of years ago. Um, our first year, um, we saw about $20 million in contributions uh, uh, to, to give to charity. And uh, last year, we saw $105 million, which, of course, was over 400% growth. So we're, we're, we're very excited about um, the product and, and the platform, but it's still very early days. So how does that work exactly? Because as I understand it, a donor advised fund is, you know, like you said, it's, it's primarily for uh, wealthy people who, who probably have a family office of some sort. And they're um, required, if I'm not mistaken, to give a percentage every year to charity through the DAF. Is that correct? No, no, no. I, I think um, it's much simpler than that. Uh, I, oh, okay. I think that there's a lot of things in the charity space. Um, and like, as you mentioned, I don't think everyone has a lawyer or accountant or wealth right. manager who, who who runs through this. But I, I think some of what you're talking about is actually very high end starting a family foundation. Right. You're talking about the uh, the billionaire crowd, et cetera. But um, donor advised funds, very simple. In some ways, it's just, you know, a tax advantaged account for putting money aside for charity, kind of like a 401k or an IRA is for retirement or, um, you know, a 529 plan might be for college savings. Uh, a donor advised fund is just an account. It has this unique advantage where you put money into this account um, that is treated as an irrevocable donation to the charity that hosts the fund. You get this deduction on your taxes for making a charitable donation, which is great. And then that money is invested tax free and grows over time. And then any time you want to donate to an operating charity, you just put a recommendation into the app. And if it's approved, it goes through and the charity gets the money. So it's really a brilliant product. The problem with this product is that it has been in the past mostly sold to um, wealthy families and individuals. And so most people have never heard of it. Um, I heard about it for the first time back when LinkedIn went public and there were a lot of financial managers and accountants, et cetera, swarming around the campus. Um, but the truth is it is a great product, uh, a great account to have for anyone who's passionate about giving, everyone who sets some money aside every year uh, to give to a few organizations that they support. Um, and most people do support organizations. They give to their kid's school, uh, maybe their alma mater, uh, maybe there's a national organization they support, maybe a religious institution, right? A church, a synagogue, et cetera. And so having a donor advised fund just means that you can put that money aside, have it in your budget. It's in a place where you can get to it if you need to. Um, you get that tax advantage of the deduction, and then it's available anytime you're inspired to give. I mean, a lot of what we built into the Daffy product was making it exceptionally easy that when you're inspired to give, you have this app on your phone where you can go press, 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 and boom, get money to the organization you want to support. Now, tell us how the product works on the nonprofit side. Like if you're, if you are like these, one of these organizations that, you know, these people want to through Daffy give um, a donation to, 
How does that work on their side? Are they do they have like a profile on your platform? How does that work? They do. Um, Daffy, you know, um, the IRS publishes a list of every legal charity in the U.S. on an ongoing basis. You have to register. And so we support every legal charity there is. But the great thing about Daffy for the nonprofit organization is how much they don't have to do. Right. You know, it turns out most nonprofit organizations aren't big, sophisticated, sophisticated financial organizations. Right. They they're dedicated to a mission, to a community, to to a cause. Right. Like they're mostly if you have a food bank, you're mostly in the business of, of feeding people and, and making sure you have that process set up. And so Daffy basically takes all that work away from them. Right. And all they get, you know, is, is the money right delivered to them. And so whether you, contrib you, you contribute to Daffy, you can use a credit card, you can use a debit card, you can link your bank account, Apple Pay, we accept stock, we accept ETFs and mutual funds, crypto. We make it as easy as possible for people to put money aside for charity. And so we, we take all that work away from the nonprofit and we try to make it very easy for people to set up things like recurring donations. Which, of course, if you talk to most nonprofits, they'll tell you that's really what they want to see from their donors. It's not just a one-time gift, but ongoing support for the organization. And so a lot of organizations are spending time out there trying to figure out how they can better utilize donor-advised funds and, and the people who put money aside into them. Um, we're just trying to make that as easy as possible for people and as broadly available as possible. That's incredible. And the growth you've experienced sounds incredible. How, how do you? Where do you go from here? Oh, it's still very early days. I mean, we have a fairly audacious, audacious goal, I would say, um, for the platform, right? You know, our basic insight is that actually giving is is a really large market in the U.S. It, it's a huge part of the economy. It's almost half a trillion dollars a year going to charity in the U.S. But we actually, as big as that number is, um, we think it could be bigger. You know, the research says that when people are intentional, when they when they set a goal for their giving, when they pre-commit, they end up giving 32% more to charity. Mm -hmm. And so as big as the number is in the U.S., we actually think that most people actually don't give as much to charity as they want to, right? Life gets in the way, et cetera. And so we're, we're hoping to build a platform where at scale, you know, millions of people who care about causes and organizations are putting money aside and it's a better place for them to discover from each other other organizations and causes they can support. And it's a better place for nonprofits to find people who care about the causes um, and, and the initiatives that they're driving. What does a typical day look like for you? Oh, uh, you know, in some ways it's mundane. I, I live in in Silicon Valley, but, you know, my, my day mostly starts like most parents with, uh, you know, the rush to get the kids out to school. Um, uh, my wife and I have four children, so, um, you know, it turns out drop off is not as easy as you might think. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it starts there and there's some coffee in the morning, but, um, you know, one of the, the habits that I got into, uh, earlier in my career, it was advice actually from, uh, one of the partners I worked for at a venture capital firm was really to be intentional going into the day, um, the week, the month, any time period about what were the three most important things you were going to get done. And so in the morning, I tend to always make sure or the night before make sure that i know ahead of time going into the day that there's at least three things that i have to get done i mean now usually i have to get like 100 things done but but at least i like to know what the highest priority things that i'm going to get done that day and that way you know day to day week to week etc you're always moving and making progress on the things that matter the most how do you stay motivated i mean you've had an incredible career linkedin wealth front um I'm sure I'm missing some eBay. Like you, you've you've worked with these incredible companies, Dropbox, by the way. Um, how do you stay motivated? I mean, what what had you sign up for a, for another round? This is a great question. Uh, I get it a lot. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough in my career that at a number of different times, I had to ask the question: Well, what do you want to do next? I had multiple opportunities. And I think, you know, some of it is based on, you know, my background as an engineer, et cetera. I love building things. I love products. I like seeing technology applied to problems that matter. And there's some truth to the fact that if you want to see something built, if you want to see something in the world, um, sometimes you can invest in a company that, that that's going to do it and a great team. Um, but sometimes you dig in and do it yourself. 
Um, and so Daffy, my current company, is, is very much about that. I, I was not convinced that a platform like this was going to get built any other way unless we built a new company, a new organization, a, a new platform to do it. But if I look at all these different career decisions along the way, there was always a point of like, well, what am I really looking for? Where do I feel like I can add the most value? What's the best opportunity? And the hard part, of course, is really being introspective and thinking about where you're going to do your best work, what's going to motivate you. And so each step of the way, I've asked those questions. And I've been fortunate enough that, you know, the answer to those questions each time led to some amazing opportunities, right? I remember, you know, thinking about what I was going to do uh, after eBay. And a friend of mine introduced me to Reed Hoffman. We had a long breakfast talking about the future of the web and product and, and what that meant for, you know, professionals and, and, and marketplaces. And, um, you know, I think it was something like a week or two later, I started at LinkedIn. Right? <laughs> LinkedIn was quite small at the time. Um, and now that's become an amazing platform. And so when I think about LinkedIn, when I think about Wealthfront, eBay, Dropbox, um, or Daffy, you know, taking a little bit of time in between to actually think about what you've learned and 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 how you're going to apply that and, and and what you want to do next i think that some of us get trapped a little bit into that cycle without actually taking the time to think about our careers our jobs or what to do next and i really do recommend that people do find the way to take that time if they can i mean you you know every few years you get this opportunity to think about what you want to do next how are you going to grow where can you have the most impact and I, I think that it's worth taking that opportunity when, when life presents it. What did you learn about leadership from Reed? Oh, so much. Um, Reed's, Reed's a very interesting uh, person, obviously very unique. It's not surprising to me that he's had the success that he's had. But for me, from what Reed did fantastically well was just around the clarity of his thinking strategically like why a company needed to exist, why a platform, why now? Um, some of the advice I give to product leaders and to leaders in general uh, is around strategy, that clarity of, of letting your team know what, what game are you playing and, and how do you keep score? And a lot of that insight I got from Reed. Um, Reed was also very thoughtful about things like leadership and, and, and transition and, and, and how to scale organizations. He's a natural venture thinker. Um, you know, building a company, building a platform involves solving a thousand different problems. There's no way you could solve them all at once. And so that phase thinking of like, no, 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 this year, this is the next problem we have to solve. He was always very good with the team about, you know, hey, you know, growth, engagement, revenue, these are all problems that we have to, we have to work on. But what's the most impro important problem to work on this year, this quarter, right now? Um, and, you know, prioritization, right? Strategy, those frameworks. If they don't come from the top, you, you run a real risk, especially if you're running a great organization where you hire a lot of brilliant, motivated, ambitious people. Um, if you don't give them the framework to operate in, um, they will come up with their own. And it yeah. may not be aligned with what the company needs. It may not be aligned with your vision. It may not be aligned with what all the other people at the company are doing. And so I, I think there really is a lot of leadership responsibility around the framing, around the strategy that you give your team. Um, and a lot of that insight I got from Reed. How are you thinking about AI as it relates to Daffy? Are you going to implement oh. that into the product at all? Or yeah, I mean, and even just generally given your vast experience in, in tech and as a developer, I'd love just your overall thoughts on the technology as well. Oh, uh, well, I mean, I think, I mean, true to my roots and uh, I think where I am in Silicon Valley, I think everyone is excited about all the different things that AI can do. And, um, there's a flurry of activity because the technology is moving quickly right now. Um, and even if fundamentally the technology isn't moving quickly, it, it's the end result, the improvement in, in what these LM models can do has just been phenomenal. And if you think about how short the time has been since uh, OpenAI released you know, GPT for people to play with, it really has not been a lot of time. Now, at Daffy, of course, we look at the same way a lot of startups look at it, which is how can we use this technology and platform to do what we do better and, and, and rethink some of the things we do. And some of them are soft touches, right? It, it might mean that when you make a donation on Daffy, instead of just getting a table of data, you get language framed to you, you know, um, in English, right? Kind of 
you know, as a thank you for for what you've done and 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 encouraging people to give a bit more. Um, we certainly have used AI on on the development side. You know, there are old. You know, we're in the nonprofit industry. You'd be surprised how much government data comes in these really arcane and archaic formats. And the ability now using AI to not only run through that data, but then process it and turn it into something that humans will find accessible. I mean, it's fantastic, right? A lot of people want to know more about the organizations they're donating to. And a lot of that data is hidden away in places that's hard for people to get to or, or understand. And AI helps Daffy do all those things better, at least the technology and tools. Um, but I mean, I think in general, um, there's a lot of different camps around AI right now, a lot of fighting going on online and even in uh, political circles. Um, I, I tend to be an optimist about technology. I tend to think more about all the new things that we can do with the technology, all the things we can improve. And so I'm very bullish on the technology. I do think it's a massive platform shift. These platform shifts don't happen that often in the industry, but reliably every five to seven years, something forces you to rethink, wait, that used to be very expensive and difficult to do at scale. And now it's become inexpensive and very simple to do. That changes everything. And so um, I think like a lot of people in Silicon Valley, I think that we're going to see a lot of amazing products and services. Uh, sorry, products and services come out in the next uh, few years um, that are really going to change the way people look at what they can do online and what they can do with technology. Um, so I'm very excited about it um, in general. Yeah, when you think of like uh, uh, the debate that's happening and the people who are kind of down on AI, I, I tend to share your view on being optimistic about it. I never really understand like, you know, AI is going to um, destroy humanity, turn on us, all that type of stuff. I, I the, the only problem is I never really get a good answer to as to how. Do you have like an answer as to like how that would happen? Oh, I, I, unfortunately, actually, I, I think that's, there's almost some danger <laughs> To asking that question because that really <laughs> gives license to you know every sci-fi fan to come up with their favorite movie or story etc and by the way there's a lot of creative people out there right like you know I i'm not a big horror movie fan or you know genre and that sort of thing but like you kind of don't want to go through horror movies and come up with all the crazy ways that people have come up to terrify people like terrifying situations like that that etc um no, I, I think that um, I think there's always a fear that people have around technology. And I think it's just getting applied to AI as well, which is, wait, this is going to change a lot of things. What happens to all the people who did that for a living? Um, you know, they'll get replaced. Right. You know, there's um, there's, there's always an analogy that floats around a little bit. You know, it's, it's kind of like moving from, you know horse-drawn carriages and riding horses to, you know, automobiles or other forms of transportation, right? And then they show this crazy chart of like, well, how many horses are there? And it you know, scares <laughs> everyone. Um, and, and look, there's a lot of intelligent reasons to be apprehensive about some of the things that could happen with artificial intelligence, especially if we end up creating things that actually have the ability to reason, um, you know, and interoperate with people and, and do things, especially things that humans can't do. Right. You know, what if we make something that's smarter than us in, in some way and dimension? I think in some ways that's inevitable, um, given the way the technology is progressing. But, you know, I think what people miss about the technology and the reason I tend to bias towards the positive is that the history of technology is that actually in the end, it's humans that are the source of value and they ascribe value right in the economy and what we're doing. And so inevitably with technology, technology ends up being utilized by humans to do things better and more valuable. And then when you do things that are more valuable, you get more of it, right? You know, so many people were worried about, you know, spreadsheets and, and software replacing accountants, but it actually really just changed what good accountants do. And I don't think today most accountants would want to live in a world where they didn't have access to computers or spreadsheets, et cetera. Um, and, and you see this across the board with a lot of different technology examples. And so, um, I tend to think um, when I look at my own investments as an angel investor, et cetera, and, and my exposure to artificial intelligence, in the end, it always ends up being a tool that allows people to do far more than they could have done before. And when a person does something that's more valuable than what they do before, they're worth more, right? They're more valuable. They're more productive. And so, of course, you want more people like that. You want more jobs like that. You want more activity. And so I, I think that artificial intelligence is going to be a huge economic boon um, for society, for people, et cetera. I think we're going to see new companies and products built. 
Um, and yes, I think that some of the existing products and services that are built will seem somewhat anachronistic in a world where we take AI for granted, but that's true with every transition. And we've been through a lot of transitions in the industry, even in my lifetime. Let's go to another transition or debate that's that's happening in Silicon Valley, and that is like this work from home, hybrid, everybody in the office, uh, everybody virtual. How have you decided to handle that issue within Daffy? Well, we didn't have much choice. It, it turns out Daffy was founded in the midst of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and so you were either going to build the company remote first or you weren't going to build the company. Um, and I think like a lot of people have seen a lot of real benefits, some that are obvious, right? You're not spending as much money on, you know, real estate or kind of, you know, in office perks, um, you know, benefits of having access to talent anywhere, right? I mean, Silicon Valley has a lot of talent, but it's not like it has a lock on every brilliant engineer or designer marketer out there. It, it's phenomenal to be able to to tap into talent and find people. I mean, this is the passion that I had at LinkedIn was, you know, LinkedIn always talks about connecting talent with opportunity. And, and there's no question that remote work opens that up. Um, and there's actually some subtle benefits to it. I think culture benefits, you know, Daffy, I'm a big believer in writing things down, expressing, you know, not um, actually putting, you know, whether it's pen to paper, you know, typing it out, um, using documents instead of presentations, et cetera. And when you build a remote first company, um, you end up building a culture that really forces you to write things down, you know, you know, which which I think improves the quality of thinking and discussion and the decision making that happens. Um, that being said, there are some real benefits to being in person. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that for people early career, it's very hard to put a price on the value of unplanned interactions um, with senior members of the team, with other folks who've been around. I mean, I think about my early days at companies and, and, and how many things I learned from people, not because I was assigned to a project with them, but because I saw them, you know, in the lunchroom, you know, in the cafeteria, or I saw them walking down the hall or um, was introduced to them by someone else kind of semi-randomly for social reasons. And so it's hard for me to you know, like, I think there really are some benefits in office. Also, when I'm hashing through problems on product, I mean, Alejandro and I as co-founders, like we still hash them out in person for the most part, right? We somehow we can get done, you know, those, those difficult decisions of what is the MVP, what features are in or out, how is the thing going to work or scale? Somehow we can get done in just a couple hours in person and a whiteboard, things that seem to cycle, take longer when you're going back and forth or doing Zoom meetings, et cetera. And so um, like anything, I think there's pros and cons, but for Daffy, we, we're kind of hybrid at this point. We have a number of people who come into headquarters in the office. Um, some who come in every day, sometimes a few days a week, um, but we also depend on the talent. We have members of the team um, in different time zones, in different countries. Um, and it's been really phenomenal to just have the opportunity to work with talent like that um, from around the country and in some cases, other countries. How do you define and maintain culture given all of that? Like, how do you maintain and, um, you know, your values? And, and honestly, it'd be interesting to hear what Daffy's values are. But um, how do you maintain that virtually? Well, I think, listen, um, everyone knows this um, and this has been often discussed, but culture often talked about, but actions speak louder than words, right? It, it, it's behavior. And I, I think there's no substitute for leadership behavior, um, for how teams make decisions, like people watch, they see, they internalize, you know, what's rewarded. Um, and so I don't think that changes with remote first, but we do have some traditions at Daffy that I think have turned out to be very useful. So for example, I do do a weekly all hands with everyone. Um, I'm, you know, most of the team here at Daffy is, is building the product, is building the platform, working on new things. Um, it just turns out my role t is a little bit more outward facing. And so I, very often every week I talk about where the company is and how I'm thinking about it. Um, and that echoes back to a process we put in place that I'm a big believer in as a leader, which is every six months, I write a document for the whole company that explains where we are, what we've learned, what our strategy is, and what that means for the next 12 months. Um, and we actually have an offsite with the whole team. We get together all in person at least twice a year where we all review that strategy and talk about it and what it means for our roadmap, what it means for prioritization, what it means for the features we're building. 
And so I think there's a lot you have to on culture that actually depends on communication and framing um, and, and then behavior. Um, another tradition we have is that every Friday morning, we have a Zoom with everyone on it where people share what they worked on this week. Developers, the code, designers, the design, marketers, what they're working on. Um, and it's a wonderful way to touch base and softly get together and actually reward the behaviors that you want to reward, which is sharing the information about what you're working on, where you're running into trouble, things that you're excited about, and allowing some of those impromptu kind of conversations and connections to happen. But, um, you know, in general, I don't think it's a solved problem. I, I, I think that culture is something that you build over time. And like I said, I, I, you know, in general, these decisions come up and as a leader, you know, you, you're faced with dozens of decisions every day, every week, every month, but a lot of culture is based on how those decisions actually get made um, and how the team internalizes, right. You know, what the priorities are and, and, and what, what acceptable behavior is at the company. Uh Kind of along those same lines, it, it seems to me like all the CEOs and leaders that I talk to say, wow, it's it's fascinating how often I have to think about or even comment on things that have nothing to do with my company, but are happening in the world, like the macro yeah. economic world, the, you know, if there's a war in Ukraine, all of a sudden that's going to like these types of things where it seems like 20 years ago, you could really just kind of focus on leading your company and you didn't have to kind of weigh in on these ty these types of things. How do you think about your role there in things that are happening outside the company? Um, and how do you think just generally about the current macroeconomic environment and, you know, what, what we're in for for this year? <laughs> and, then, and then the the question about the macro uh, comes in afterward. It's, <laughs> it's good. I like that. I like that. Why are CEOs asked all these questions? And by the way, here's a question. Um, <laughs> no, I like it. It's good. It's good. I like it. But no, you know, in the end, I think it's a mistake for leaders to ever forget that companies, the value is sourced from the people. And I know that's a little bit of a, a truism and, and it might seem uh, obvious, but it's very easy to forget. You, you look at an, if you look at a company enough financially, you look at the, the spreadsheets and the numbers and the margins, et cetera, you start thinking that the company is somehow an outcome of those numbers, right? Uh, venture capitalists, founders will talk about strategy or technology. But we were talking about AI earlier, right? And it's easy to think that that's where the value gets created. Um, but no, it's actually the people and the team. And I, I think the reason a lot of leaders and a lot of CEOs got pulled into these issues is really two trends that happen. One is social media opened up this role of people seeing executives, seeing leaders in their personal lives. Right. I mean, Hollywood celebrities were used to this a long time. If you had a, a job in the media, you might get used to some of your personal life getting exposed. But for the first time, you started seeing it, it, these questions came up like, who who is this person? And, and, and more information was out there. And then second, you saw this. I think you saw an increasing trend in the last 10 to 15 years where the economy was good enough. Right. And there's a huge competition for talent, especially in technology. There's always a huge competition for talent, almost always. And so people had a lot of choices about where they wanted to work and they wanted to work at places where they believe in the leadership. They believe in what they're building and what they're doing. And that can easily cross over into who the leader is and, and how they think about different issues. Now, like everything that can go too far, right? Like you're asking, like, there's a lot of very important international, political, economic issues where sure, lots of people have opinions and, and sort of the executives um, at companies and leaders. Um, but that may not be the most important thing or most relevant thing for actually what the team and what the company is trying to build right now or what success looks like. And sometimes it can distract you from that. So I think a lot of leaders and CEOs are, are struggling with that. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, personally, I always struggle with how much information personally to put out there, what's too much, you know, when am I speaking for myself? When am I speaking for the company? And, and so I think everyone's been navigating that the last, certainly the last five to seven years, if not longer. Uh, but from my point of view, I, I think there's an authenticity to, to being who you are. And there's a balance to building out a culture where you give people the comfort to know that they can express themselves and they also can be who they are um, and who they need to be to do their best work. But also the the clarity of saying, you know, but when you're working, when you're you're working for a company, like there's a focus there, right? What's relevant and not relevant for the company, right? You know, diverse teams of people from different backgrounds and different beliefs 
can come together and build amazing things together if they focus on the problem, if they focus on the product, if they focus on the customer. And I think that leaders do have a responsibility to remind people of that reality and actually pattern that behavior themselves, right? You know, you can't you can't be a leader talking about what you're doing on the weekend or your opinion about, you know, the latest movie that came up and then somehow think it's frivolous if your employees do the the same thing, right? That's a, that that's just hypocrisy. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but it also can be very clear that sometimes, you know, that when you're working for a company, a platform, that you have to you have to be careful. You are representing the company in some way, and, and there's a little bit of a burden on that. And so, I think that you know it's a hard problem. Um, but um, I, I personally enjoy it. I, I don't mind commenting on things out there when I think they're relevant. I think leaders can get themselves in trouble, right? You have expertise in one domain or another domain; it doesn't necessarily carry over into everything. And so. I always like to show a little bit of, of humility around the areas where I'm less confident or I feel like I have less education or knowledge. Um, so I try to stick a little bit closer to home in terms of the things and the problems that I've worked on. But um, I, I think there's a lot of different patterns out there for leaders and a lot of debate. Right? I think this is a very active area of debate amongst executives and leaders about what are the best patterns. Um, Oh, you asked you you did ask a question. The macro environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we actually run into this a lot because I get asked the question a lot at Daffy, right? So we we have a front row seat to what's going on with giving, um, and to some extent, a lot of the problem we work on is grounded in personal finance, kind of individual pocketbooks. Like, when do people feel like they have money available to give to put aside, and what are the stresses and strains on on their financial lives? So we do have a little bit of a window into that. Um, and so I don't mind commenting. I mean, I think the macro environment right now is confusing for a lot of people for a number of reasons. Um, one is, let's not forget, we we just had a pandemic, which is kind of a once in a century kind of phenomenon, um, at least when you look back. And so that's out of most people's memory space. And so I, I think it'd be, you'd have to have an amazing amount of ego and hubris to believe that you could totally predict all the economic ramifications of what we just went through in the last few years. And so I think that's still working through the system, both in explicit actions and in changes in consumer behavior, right, which drives dollars. Um, obviously, we had surges of government intervention, uh, money, we're, we're dealing with those. It's not quite the same thing as the great financial crisis, you know, 15 years ago. It's not the, quite the same thing as when the bubble burst. And so I think everyone's dealing with that. And then, of course, it's an election year. And so... Um, one of the increasing things you see in the data is that people's opinions about the economy seem to be more and more driven by politics and less and less driven by the actual dollars and cents of what's going on in their financial lives. Right? We, we're we human. We all pick and choose what we focus on. And uh, it, it looks like politics um, is driving a lot of opinions from people. But I'll say from giving, what we're seeing is that, you know, like from the platform like Daffy, is that actually people are very aware of problems going on in different communities. They, they're, they're aware of this lumpiness in the economy. Some people are doing phenomenally well in this economy. Some people are still struggling. Um, some people did well and found systems that got them through the pandemic, but they want to go back a little bit to what they did before, and they're trying to figure out how to do that. And that's true for individuals. That's true for businesses. Uh, but what we see on giving is that people still realize that organizations need their support. And a lot of people are thinking, how do I do that better? How do I do that more consistently? And so there, you see this amazing growth in the donor advised fund market, not just Daffy, but the entire category is just exploding year over year as more and more people discover that there's a, there's a way to put money aside for charity that might be smarter from a tax perspective, might be smarter from a personal budgeting perspective. And, um, and they're finding a lot of reward in that. So, um, I don't know if you have something specific about the macro environment. I'm happy to, you know, no, I just wonder, like, you know, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, like obviously the United States is going to have an election this year. About 20 other countries are going to have an election. Like election years are kind of unpredictable. Um, I wonder how much you think about, I mean, I, this isn't a political show and I, you know, but I wonder how much you think about, you know, just the cultural ramifications of things like that. You know, I mean, I think like anyone, you know, first and foremost, right? I'm, I'm here in society. I'm a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, 
there, there's a lot of us, uh, but we all have opinions, right? And and we all have a life to lead and we only get one. So, um, you know, you have to put some thought into these things um, and interact. And so like a lot of people, I think about my family. I think about my community. I, I think about the groups that I belong to in the organizations. And I, of course, think of things at the national level, et cetera. Um, for me, I mean, you know, coming from Silicon Valley, I tend to take the point of view. Listen, I, I said earlier, I'm a technology optimist. I, I think that through a number of both intentional actions and accidents of history, Silicon Valley ended up creating, um, not just creating, I would say, but really proving out the the dynamism that can come from enabling people to build new products, build new companies, build new services. And I look at the economic value, and, and not just economic value, but I look at, at how the positive impact all of this amazing economic growth and, and productivity and all these new technologies have, have, have unleashed. And so my biggest concern, you know, right now is that we don't forget the, the lessons of the past, right? You know, like Silicon Valley did not happen, you know, with top-down orchestration, right? You know, um, a lot of the best products and services that happened um, didn't happen because some executive at a big company decided to invest in that area. Um, or at least they didn't happen completely because of that. Um, sometimes we don't give enough credit to the research and development that happens years and decades before the commercial success happens. Um, so for me, I, I tend to spend a lot of my time being an advocate for innovation, um, advocate for um, all the systems that that come together to, to keep companies um, being built, new products and services. I love encouraging education and getting more people educated. I love encouraging company formation and entrepreneurship, um, widening out the availability of investment and, and, and that capability, telling more people that they can build businesses or that it's not scary necessarily to join a new business and how to manage their career. And then, of course, on the political front, I tend to be a big advocate for opening things up to to, to open up that opportunity to more and more people, right? Like, um, and so I, I spend my time there, but, you know, one of the advantages of actually being a founder and, and running a new startup, you don't have a lot of time for other things. Yeah, <laughs> and so true. I find that most of my days are really focused on how do we make this incredible platform, this vision that that we have of a place that brings together millions of people who are all putting money aside for charity and the organizations and causes they support. Um, most of my hours are spent on that problem, um, which takes me a little bit away from, from macro issues. That's incredible. Adam, I can't thank you enough for, for spending the time with us. Um, we end every interview with the same question, and that is at CEO.com. We believe the chances one takes is just as, or the chances one gives, sorry, is just as important as the chances one takes. I wonder when you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? Oh, you know, this is a, it's a great question. Um, but I, I don't know if I could pick just one person. Um, I, you know, if, if I think back through my career, there's so many times where you're given a shot. I mean, even when I was at LinkedIn, I actually spent a lot of time on this design thing, the, the hope, the what if, what if I get this job? What if I get this role, this opportunity? Um, you know, and so there's so many people um, that I support. I'm, I'm always grateful. Um, you know, Craig Federighi at, at Next, actually even before it merged with Apple, you know, took a shot on hiring me out of school as an engineer. And it's it's hard for me to think about what my career would have been like otherwise. Um I think about folks like Reed Hoffman, who you know gave me a shot at running core product at LinkedIn, which turned out to be an amazing platform and team and company to be a part of. Uh, so there's just so many people along the way um, that you're inspired by or give you a shot. And so um, anyway, th th those are some names, but uh, I, I, I tend to see that opportunity all the time, and it still happens to this day. You know, a lot of Silicon Valley, a lot of companies. I mean, when I make an angel investment, you know, like when I invest in a company like Figma, I mean, Dylan has done an amazing job. That company is incredible. You know, did did I give him a shot by you know supporting him and and writing a check in the early days when a lot of people wouldn't, um, or did he give me a shot to be a part of that company and? give me the opportunity to invest in it. You know, it, it, there's always two sides to these things. And so I, I think that that magic and, and, and those moments um, when people bet on each other is probably what I think about most when I think about that question. That's incredible. Well done. Good investment on Figma, by the way. 
Uh, I like at this point, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, Dylan did me quite a bit of favor of in, involving me. And, and, and actually I, I, I tell everyone now, like, you know, be, be nice to the interns. He was an intern at LinkedIn, um, back in the day. That's how I first met him. I was a VP. Right. And when we got along, but you know, the magic of, of Silicon Valley is, you know, he went off and when he had an idea for a company, he, he came to me for advice. Um, you know, you don't have to do these things, but this is what I love about that culture in Silicon Valley, the pay it forward culture. Yeah. A lot of what happens in Silicon Valley doesn't happen for pure financial reasons. It happens because we realize that everyone has this hard problem of the, building new technology, building new companies, and it's hard. And, you know, someone helped you. A lot of people gave advice and helped you and spent time that they didn't have to spend when you needed it. And you pay it back when you're later in your career. Um, it's, it's what I try to do as an investor and an advisor today. Um, it's what I try to do as a leader. But um, it is one of the parts of the culture that I hope that we don't lose. I, I think that there's a real economic price to be paid for purely transactional cultures. And I think one of the things that's made technology boom in the last 50 years has been that culture of people leaning into things, not because it makes financial sense per se, but because they're excited about what the technology can do and the value it can create for people. Yeah, I agree with that totally. Adam, thank you so much. Uh, what an honor to have you on here. No, oh, thank you for having me.